the days that Christine and I got. Yeah, so I'll be talking about some recent measurements that my group has done. This is actually going to be the thesis work of my former student and now postdoc Joe Osborne, searching for TMD factorization breaking in both proton-proton and proton nucleus collisions. This is in the context of uh, Roger Mulder's prediction of TMD factorization breaking from 2010. I'll also spend some time talking a little more generally about polar interactions in QCD. Uh, so thinking of you know color interactions in QCD, of course the sign change predicted um, uh, between Sidious and Gillian uh, of the PT odd transverse momentum dependent distributions uh, is due to color exchange uh, between partons involved in the hard scattering and remnants of uh, the incoming uh, hadrons. And the 2010 <coughs> prediction for uh, team defactorization breaking and color entanglement by Ted and Pete um, was really a natural extension of this uh, from the uh, Sidis and Julianne phase, which of course is leading our, our QED processes involving hadrons, now to hadro production of hadrons. So proton-proton uh, -proton production of QCD bound states if you're taking into account non you're sensitive to some kind of non-perturbative transverse momentum scale. So if you're in a TMD picture. Uh, so TMD factorization is broken, and the partons uh, become correlated across the two colliding protons. So this really uh, captured my imagination when it came out in uh, 2010. So um, and I can think about this in a number of different ways. One is a sort of an interaction picture right, about um, the color flow. So this diagram is from the paper. And you have this uh, um, gluon exchange between a parton involved in the hard scattering and a hadron remnant, both in the initial state and the final <laughs> state. And then you get these color flow paths uh, that pass through the two gluons. So, so there's this blue, a little bit hard to see on here on the screen, uh, the, this blue one and this red one here. And so you have color flow that can't be described as flow the two gluons separately requires presence of them. And this sets up uh, this entanglement, these quantum correlations of these partons across the colliding protons. Uh, and this is, I mean, if I think of it as a, a novel, I can think of it as an interaction, I can also think of it as a state, so the new, um, new uh, QCD state, this new quantum correlated parton system. And it's a consequence of QCD specifically as a non abelian gauge theory, the fact that the gluons uh, couple to themselves. So uh, back in 2010, right after this uh, prediction came out, uh, I was organizing a TMD workshop at Trento with Alessandro. Um, I think also, right? Here. Um, <clears throat> and I uh, had a lot of discussions with Ted and John Collins while I was there about how we might be able to do this uh, at RIC, since we've got our PP collider at our disposal. So, what do you need? What ingredients do you need to search for evidence of color entanglement? You need an observable sensitive to a non perturbative momentum scale. Uh, so, we looked at, decided to look at so nearly back to back particle production. So, you're looking at the out of plane momentum component. So say one, uh, one particle with respect to the other to get sensitivity to a non-perturbative transverse momentum scale. You need two initial QCD bound states uh, because you're, you need color exchange between a scattering parton and the remnant of the other proton. Uh, obviously, Rick uh, works for this as a PP collider. And you need at least one final QCD bound state to have the exchange um, between a scattered parton and either remnant. Right, you need this one change in both the initial and the final states. So on PP collisions at Phoenix, uh, we thought um, we would proceed by measuring the out-of-plane momentum component in nearly back-to-back -back photon hadron and hadron hadron production. So if you look at these vector diagrams here, uh, so this is a photon hadron production. Um, and this uh, the beam would be going into uh, the plane of the board. Uh, so I'm looking at the transverse plane. I measure. Uh, an isolated photon on one side, and uh, the, the red vector here would be the partonic um, jet, if you will, the outgoing parton, that's in a leading order picture. Uh, but uh, Phoenix is not a very good detector for reconstructing jets, are can be much better than that, they have better acceptance. So we're looking at final state hadron. Uh, and now you look at delta phi uh, between your measured photon and your measured uh, hadron, uh, and uh, the uh, in a non perturbative regime, this um, out of plane momentum component here, right? So I'm just taking this is what we're actually going to make distributions of this P out. Um, so this blue vector, vertical vector, as it's drawn here. Um, and this P out is due to uh, the uh, initial KT 
vector sum of the partons involved in the hard scattering. And then uh, since I'm measuring a hadron rather than a final state jet, so I'm sensitive also to any non-perturbed transverse momentum contributions from the fragmentation process. In the case of dihadron, it's a similar picture, but now instead of measuring uh, a photon on this side, uh, so again, the red vectors would be sort of the leading order partonic outgoing ones. Uh, but now I'm measuring a hadron, two hadrons, right? And so I'm measuring these black vectors. Uh, so this we call our trigger hadron, and it tends to be higher PT. Uh, um, so in our case, it's a neutral pion because we have, look at the decay to two photons, we have a nice electromagnetic trigger for Phoenix. Uh, and again, uh, it's a charged hadron actually um, as the second associated hadron. And then Mathematically, what this p out quantity is is just the pt of the associated hadron times the sign of the delta phi angle between them. Uh, so the original strategy uh, to actually search for effects from polar entanglement was to. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So in the drawing, you are you are also drawing the sum of the direct photon and pt associated uh, momenta, but I don't understand if this is something that you. Me, want to measure, need to measure, is it relevant, or in the end you just need the PT of the hadron? So what we actually measure is the PT of the two hadrons and the angle, as an equal angle between them, so we're projecting the transverse plane. Uh, and then from that, just by multiplying PT of this hadron times the sine of the as an equal opening angle between them, we get this P out quantity. Right. So you, you, don't, you don't need to, to you, you do the PT associated, or what you call PT associated, but you actually do don't this need to. One, not this, this one with the hat is the partonic yeah, yeah, one, which we're not measuring. The, sorry, the yeah. one with the hat, you don't need to measure it. You're not measuring it. And you need to That's right. And we're, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so the original strategy was to uh, compare out-of-plane momentum component distributions to calculations assuming that TMD factorization holds. We don't have any calculations assuming it's broken. Um, and look for differences in the shape and or magnitude of the distribution. Uh, so here this is from our first paper, which came out in 2017. This was looking at uh, photon, hadron, and dihadron um, in uh, 510 GeV, center of mass uh, PP collisions. Uh, this is looking at uh, delta phi angles uh, nearly back to back, so 2 pi over 3 to 4 pi over 3 is where we're um, uh, uh, taking our associated hadrons. We get this tier, clear two component distribution, so it's Gaussian near zero. Uh, so P out uh, near zero, we get this Gaussian behavior, and it goes to a power law as you go to larger P out. And these are, this is coming from kicks from hard, so perturbative gluon radiation. So it's this region close to zero that's sensitive to our non physics. And I'd like to emphasize that these curves are fits to Gaussian and Kaplan functions. They are not calculations. No calculations were available, and we still don't have calculations available. Um, and the different bin, different colors here are different bins in hard interaction scale, so which is the PT of the direct photon or PT of our uh, neutral pion as a, as a proxy for our hard scale and working in PP. The photons are isolated? Photons are isolated, yes. Uh, so since we had no calculations to make a direct comparison to see what these uh, shapes, uh, uh, magnitudes uh, might look like, any deviations, um, uh, we uh, had further discussions, mainly with John Collins, uh, uh, a few years later now after these initial discussions, and we thought maybe we could try looking at the evolution uh, of the non-perturbative transverse momentum winds with the hard scale. Um, and so the, all these different uh, colors here are for the different hard scales. So we can look at how these widths are changing as a function of that hard scale. And why did we... Yes? What is what? What is P out? Uh, so it is this vector here. So you measure... The dark photon case is a little bit easier to look at. So I measure dark photon. I you know, just project 180 degrees from that, and then I, look at, I measure a second particle, and I'm looking at the out of plane momentum component of that associated hadron produced nearly back to back. Uh, so it's sensitive to both uh, initial states, transverse momentum, and any transverse momentum picked up in, it, in the fragmentation process, since I'm measuring a hadron, not a How is the large scale defined? <laughs> 
So we are using the uh, transverse momentum of the direct photon and the photon hadron correlations, or of the neutral pion and the neutral pion hadron correlations. So we're working with PT, we don't have the, um, it's not like BIS where you have your Q squared. Um, and so these, uh, it's, yeah, again, a little bit uh, hard to see. So our, our neutral pion momentum range that we uh, measured went from 4 GeV to 15 GeV transverse momentum. The photons, uh, we have high backgrounds for isolated photons at low PT, so we start the photon um, transverse momentum at 7 GeV and go up to 15 GeV, so that should give us a sense of our hard scale for those. Uh, so we thought we could look at the evolution of the non-perturbative transverse momentum widths with the hard scale. And why did we go in this direction? Well, because the proof of TMG factorization um, directly predicts that the non-perturbative transverse momentum widths increase as a function of the hard scattering energy scale. And at least for myself, I think about this intuitively uh, as having increased phase space for gluon radiation, using soft gluon radiation. This is something that's been confirmed experimentally in both CITIS uh, and uh, JLEM. Uh, so here, just to this group, um, Working with compass multiplicities, uh, the mean PT squared as a function of uh, the log of two different um, Q values and some inclusive DIS for two different X bins. And then what I, the message here is just that the widths are getting um, getting wider as you go up in, in Q squared. This is uh, something similar for uh, Drellian. The scales of the, uh, this A value is sensitive to your non-perturbative transverse momentums as a function of Q, a bunch of fixed targets, Drellian data and the Z data. Um, so our first paper that came out in 2017 on the 510 GeV PT collisions, uh, we looked at these Gaussian widths as a function of the trigger the particle PT, so the direct photon or the pi zero transverse momentum, our proxy for the hard scale. Um, <clears throat> and we saw that the widths decrease with slight, with the hint of different slopes for the photon hadron correlations, which are the solid points, and the uh, dihedron correlations, which are the open points. Um, and one of the reasons we worked with both photon hadron and dihedron was that we thought uh, we can go three versus two, three versus two uh, non pure functions, so only one for augmentation function or two if you're working with direct photon hadron or dihedron. And you also have a different number of places to attach a glue in the final state, so we thought there might be qualitative differences between them. Uh, so we, we were really intrigued just at the fact, just by seeing these non perturbative widths, so these are these fits, these Gaussian fits to the region around P out of zero, um, seem to decrease with the hard momentum scale. Uh, however, uh, working, with, working with this and PP, uh, um, we have correlations among the measured kinematic variables. So our X values are actually correlated with our, our trigger values, of PT trig, uh, our hard scale proxy, uh, varying PT trig, our hard scale proxy for a fixed associated hadron PT range is also changing your fragmentation. Z. Um, and so we did not have a handle on these. So moving to our second paper, which was submitted earlier this year and has been accepted by PRD. Uh, so here we are working with 200 GeV PP data. And we tried to get some handle on the fragmentation Z. And when we do this, I'll show you in a second, uh, the widths actually increase. Since we don't reconstruct jets, we can't actually measure Z. Uh, what we use is a quantity that Phoenix had already published previously, as a, basically as a proxy for Z, is this Xe value, so it is a, it's dimensionless. So PT trig dot PT associate, yeah, associate, uh, associated divided by the magnitude squared of the trigger particle PP, uh, which works out to be PT magnitude of PT, PT associate divided by magnitude of PT trig. Uh, times cosine of the azimuth angle between them, and uh, pictorially it might be a little bit easier to understand. Uh, so uh, this is this green vector now. So I'm measuring the order of the plots on top and bottom. So this is the direct photon one on the bottom now as opposed to the top. Uh, and this is my P out vector again, right? And now P, uh, P trig times Xe is the magnitude uh, uh, is the magnitude here of the PT associated uh, vector projected onto uh, this extension of the direct photon PT. And here you can see just from Pythia, uh, correlation between Xe and Z. Uh, so you have this correlation, it's not equal to Z, right? Uh, but we're using it as a proxy for Z to get some kind of handle um, on the hadronization. Uh, 
So here now, um, this is over a fixed range in Xe, rather than a fixed range of Pt associated, of the associated hadron. Again, the P out distributions, and so we, again, we have photon hadron and neutral pion hadron uh, for the same momentum bins that we worked with in the 500 GeV case. Um, for center of mass energies. And now if I plot the Gaussian width, so the width of these fits as a function of my hard scale, which is always PT of the direct photon or the neutral hadron. Now qualitatively, I see that these widths are getting longer when I try to control, get a handle on this, um, on Z. Um, and if I swap this around, and now this is for a fixed range, uh, integrated over a fixed range of PT trig, PT of the photon or the mutual pion, uh, and now binned in uh, different uh, Xe ranges, so 0 0.1 to 0 0.15, 0.15 to 0.25, uh, all the way up to 0.5 to 1 is our last bin, so I can look at the Gaussian widths as a function of X, the fragmentation Xe as well, and okay, uh, we, we have no numerical um, calculations, nonological calculations, to compare to qualitatively the widths get wider when I um, look at them in this way as well. Um, in this paper, the second paper, we also compared uh, the 510 GeV from the previous paper to the 200 GeV. Um, we can do this for the same Xe range and PT trig value. Uh, so this is the Gaussian width as a function of the hard scale, PT of the trigger particle, uh, for uh, the four different sets of points are for the dihedron and photon hadron at 200 GeV and 510 GeV. Uh, relatively similar widths uh, for uh, these different um, data sets. Now if I plot instead as a function of Xt defined as 2 PT of the photon or neutral pion divided by root S, so it's the transverse analog of find the X basically, so the fractional transverse energy with respect to half the center of mass energy. Um, and it ends up being correlated with X. Again, it's not actually X, which we can't reconstruct directly in these uh, PP measurements. Uh, so now you can see these uh, square points are for the 510 GeV, these ones here, and the circles are for the 200 GeV. So at a similar um, XT, and integrated over the same range of XE, you get higher widths in the higher center of mass energy. It's probably not, uh, not surprising. How does that compare to the like, old fixed target? Um, I mean, uh, so the old fixed target, I mean, for example, even Tevatron has some uh, you know, pair measurements, I think. Yeah. Right? So there, there's a point on the landscape, right, in some sense. Um, we could try to look at that. Mm -hmm. what, what, yeah, we, we could try to look at that. Uh, what gets tricky is that the, the it's trying to do things apples to apples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, um, between exact general definitions and then integrations uh, over different ranges right. of kinematic variables. So that was one thing that was nice about being able to do these measurements in the same, you know, right. the same detector um, and with the same group of people. In a, uh, so, but yeah, that's something we could look at. Mm -hmm. So quali I mean, qualitatively, it's, you know, the behavior with root S is similar, but I don't, I don't, I don't have quantitative yeah. plots to show you in this talk. But I guess the increase is sort of a um, good thing, right? I mean, I think it intuitively... Intuitively, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that it would that increase the state of that would lead to a decrease of just the width of that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Spectacular. But, uh, our, yes, from our first paper, we spent a lot of time, as you might imagine, uh, when we saw the width decreasing, uh, trying to think of how this might happen. Um, and, and having discussions with Ed and John and then did I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's not so obvious how that could happen. Yeah. So maybe a nice question, but if you if you uh, take the average value of QT as a function of the hard scale, then you expect to probe the TMB evolution and then the slope to increase without uh, but if you know yeah. with X, <coughs> then you're not probing direct evolution, but you're most likely probing the TMB structure of as a, function of X. as a function of X. And that that I don't have an intuition of why it should be increased. Uh, it could be stable, it could be decreasing. It's the evolution that is increasing by the width because you have the Q and because of the log of Q, then the width in, is increasing by it. I mean, if you're probing X, then you're when you normalize to take the average value, yeah. you divide 
the evolution, and then therefore what you're left is with the PMP structure of the initial final state. So the X dependence of the, sorry, the, how KT might be changing as a function of X, right? X KT correlations. Uh, yes. But yes. You know, tell me why it should be increasing or decreasing or anything. But, no, that's a function so, of X. So, yeah. It depends how the X goes to one, it should decrease. Yeah, we, we don't we don't we do not go close to the x equal one range. The x equal one. Much earlier than than x of one. No, earlier than point eight. You were just mentioning the x of It's not a fundamental thing. It's something. Judging on our our fit probably the x dependent is maybe not so strong unless you go to the AIX, but there is also the question of the z dependence for the fragmentation function, which is right. intertwined. Yes, and there, and there, the, the fixed range. The, uh, the kt or the, the width of the, of the fragmentation <coughs> function is a function of z is yeah. mixed okay. in also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're fixed, we have a, a our Xe, our proxy for z range is 0.1 to 0.5, so it's, it's fixed, but it's somewhat wide. Yeah. So, so why are we talking about this? Because we, we think oh, because there was an earlier comment that the, the the width needs to be increased; it's expected to increase. Right, yeah. um, so I just wanted to point out that it's expected to increase because then you're probing evolution when you're looking different values of q. But if you're probing if you're looking at different values of x instead of different values of q, then you're probably probing something else, not evolution. Probably yeah, probing the structure, the TMD structure itself. But the width would always be something relative, right? I mean, it comes from some kind of uh, continuous relative measurement. It's a normalized thing, right? I mean, I wouldn't expect So you're expecting something to be closer to what? Are you saying he has no expectation? Yeah, but I don't. I don't think this would. Um, uh, I mean, the, you mean the width <coughs> itself depends on x. Yeah, yeah, but, but definitely yeah. Yeah. Uh, from a quantum model picture to my uh, an answer from Gauss at one point I derived like, is p out uh, and function x e should be increasing. So the uh, x e square is rounding proportion to uh, x e. As a function of x, here's the guess in width as yeah. a function of x e on the previous yeah, slide. It should be like x e squared. Yes, in the Gaussian model. Uh, I guess in the model would get an x e squared dependence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think in fact, you know, this is the more like a PA, in the past, you went to the first slide, and I derived the way you met this PR. Back in I have a formula developed like based on part of so according to that formula, it is something like x e squared. This will be related to those initial part and like and I caution this plus this g of j t caution. And then in terms of j t caution, this is like one of the initial x. This is kind of like a very similar like series, you know, z squared and z. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll show so for this one is, yeah, for me it's more like uh, the opposite in that fact. And you can imagine that. But it's kind of kinematic of effects. Yeah, it's kind of kinematic, of but not at all. So let me go ahead since the chair says I have limited time here. Uh, so the conclusions from our second paper, uh, earlier this year, non perturbative momentum would seem to increase with hard scale when you fix the range of XC. So we didn't find any qualitative difference from processes where TMD factorization holds, and we still have no calculations available for quantitative comparison. Uh, so the third paper we just got out the door in September. Now this was looking at PA collisions. Part of our motivation was that you know, if you're exchanging color with the remnant uh, of one of your initial beam hadrons, uh, you would just naively think you could have stronger color fields if you have a nuclear remnant than a proton remnant. And these are all sort of exploratory measurements. Uh, we did discover that the non-perturbative widths are broadened in P gold compared to PP. Uh, so here are the P out widths for P gold uh, and PP. It's uh, the dashed versus uh, solid curves being the fits. But let me uh, show you a plot. So this is as a function of XE. 
uh, p gold, uh, the difference in the mean p squared out in p a, with uh, so minus uh, the mean p p out squared in p p, uh, as a function of x e. And here's the proton gold uh, away side, um, which is what I've been showing you. So you get this um, weird broadening. Uh, it's not significantly statistically significant in P aluminum, which was the other uh, collision species that we looked at. Um, and then we also looked at the uh, hadrons produced near the trigger particle, which was always dihadron now, so sort of in the jet of the neutral pion, if you will, uh, and didn't see any difference between P uh, A and P P. Uh, so here now is uh, this difference between in the uh, p out, mean p out squared and pa minus pp as a function of the um, number of binary nuclei on nuclear collisions, which is estimated based on backwards so the nucleus going direction multiplicities. Uh, so it seems to be uh, this broadening uh, in pa with respect to pp seems to be uh, seems to increase as a function of uh, the centrality, the number of estimated binary nuclei nuclear collisions. Of course, in PA, you have a bunch of things that could be contributing. So um, we discussed a number of them in the paper. It could be due to additional non-perturbative KT and nuclei, multiple scattering and nuclei, nuclear modification and mechanization. So there are all sorts of things that could be coming in to play here. But we did observe a qualitative difference just between the PA and the PP. Uh, so see also Joe Osborne's PhD thesis, uh, which is on the archive, um, that discusses all of this in more detail. We'll say that the very last sentence of uh, this paper, this PA paper, uh, we did give a shout out to the Electron Ion Collider uh, as uh, being important to continue shedding light on the many physical phenomena that occur in proton nucleus collisions, since we have so many things that can come into play. So some next steps for my group uh, are to search for team defactorization working at LHCB. Uh, so while we uh, eagerly await phenomenological calculations, which in Shao Hui's talk earlier this week, uh, he said uh, we're being worked on, which I'm very excited about, actually. Um, so in the meantime, well, uh, what we can do as, uh, as experimentalists is that uh, another student of mine, Jordan Roth, just started working on similar dihadron, z-hadron, and z-jet measurements at LHCB. Um, so in principle, the z-jet measurements will give a better handle on leading order of parton kinematics. However, of course, jets are more complicated objects to measure, to define, um, than hadrons. And I do note that the original Rogers and Mulder's paper was for dihadrons, not uh, specifically dijets. But we're going to look at uh, all three of these. So we'll have dihadron and z-hadron, which should be pretty analogous to our dihadron and photon hadron measurements from Phoenix. So, but we'll also have um, the z-jet measurements at LHCB. Uh, and we're, I have another student, uh, William Dean, who's working on analogous Drillian measurements at LHCB, where TMD factorization, of course, is expected to hold. Um, we're going to measure the non-perturbative region of dilepton PT, so low PT of the uh, lepton pair, but we'll also construct the same observable, or out of plane lens component, um, for the dileptons, which is not how you usually look at uh, non-perturbative uh, behavior and non perturbative effects in Drelian, but we thought so since um, uh, you can't do PT of the pair in dihedron uh, the way you can, uh, it doesn't mean uh, we want to do something that was more directly analogous to what we're able to do in dihedron measurements. So we'll look at both the traditional, you know, pair PT, but also the out of plane momentum width of, you know, one lepton with respect to the other Drelian lepton. Uh, so the Drelian. Dilepton PT versus P out is shown from uh, simulations, this is Pythia, and this is Rick Center of Mass Energy, but this is just to give people a sense. Um, one thing that so we only started thinking about this recently is that so it's possible to have um, P out close to zero, which we would say is a non perturbative uh, momentum scale, right? Uh, but PT of the pair could be anything, right? So here, in the, most of your Statistics are always at lower PT, but you could have zero P out and 10 GeV uh, for PT of the pair. So we need to think through the relation to parton KT values and what kind of projections you might be doing and what uh, which skills are really relevant in uh, so this is something we need to think through more. And uh, yes, in Yatsio, we should be able to do a PT distribution of the epsilon as well. Just a different, yeah, just a different mass cut than doing the drill-am. 
Uh, so I'd like to shift gears now uh, and talk a little more generally um, about, and speculatively perhaps, about exploring the role of color interactions in QCD. So of course this process dependent sign change for PTOD TMD functions and TMD factorization breaking, the, the, the prediction of factorization breaking are both due to color flow um, in hadronic interactions. I, I think there's been renewed and increasing interest in color interactions in recent years coming from uh, communities with different motivations actually. And I'll just uh, want to quickly um, show a few recent examples from papers. This is not by any means comprehensive, but Andreas, along with uh, Jan Zhao in 2014, had a paper titled Color Entanglement for Gamma Jet and Polarized PA Collisions. They have this new Boolean distribution function, uh, G4, uh, uh, generated by color entanglement. Uh, I was actually really happy to read this line in their paper. Can, entanglement can be seen not as a nuisance, uh, but as a chance to explore the non-trivial interplay of color flow in local non-abelian gauge series. I was very happy to see that. <laughs> the point of view I have been trying to advocate for it since the prediction came out in 2010, uh, but not everybody was uh, several years ago. Uh, and then uh, John Zhao had a follow-up paper in 2017 called uh, Color Entanglement-like Effect in Collinear Twist 3 Factorization. Uh, so that hasn't been, uh, I mean, that would be an area for further development for sure in the upcoming years. Just as a side note, I, I have to say a brief summary right up of the various sort of feel to me for creating Gluon distributions uh, could be helpful for some of us in the community. So can you have the, the white sector of Williams gluons and the typhoid gluons and the G4 and I'm trying to remember all the different, you know, T odd, chiral odd properties of nearly polarized gluons and having something where it was all made out in one place would be really helpful for me and I suspect some other people. Uh, here's some uh, other papers related to quarkonium suppression and PA and collective behavior uh, observed in high multiplicity PP collisions. So, Ma Bunu Gopal and Watanabe and Zhang in 2018, earlier this year, their title was uh, psi 2 s versus psi j psi suppression in proton nucleus collisions from factorization violating soft color exchanges. So similar ideas, but now motivated by um, heavy quarkonium suppression in PA. Uh, here's another paper, a little bit older, from 2013, Color Reconnection and Flow-Like Patterns in PP Collisions. This was following up um, the initial CMS observations in 2010 of these long-range delta work data correlations in high multiplicity PP that were reminiscent of the um, collective effects that had been believed to be due to quark long plasma formation and heavy ion collisions. A uh, paper from uh, just last month, uh, preprint probing color reconnection with underlying event observables at the LHC energies. So this really discusses how to use uh, the underlying event to look at color connections. So there's a whole history uh, we discovered a couple years ago of something that was most often called color coherence in the literature in E plus E minus, uh, P bar, P, and P, P. Uh, so these color coherence ideas are about increased soft radiation between color connected partons or remnants. And they go back to E plus E minus measurements in the 1980s. And this isn't a comprehensive list, but here's from the TPC collaboration comparison of the particle flow in QQ bar glue and QQ bar gamma events in E plus E minus annihilation from 86. The uh, Mark II collaboration comparison of the particle flow in 3-jet and radiative 2-jet events from E plus e annihilation. Uh, Opal, uh, Opal and L3 papers from LEP, a study of coherence of soft gluons and hadron jets, evidence for gluon interference in hadronic Z-decays. And then if I move to hadronic collisions at the Tevatron initially, so in three jet events and hadronic coll collisions, this color coherence idea predicts that gluon radiation uh, leading to the lowest PT jet of a three jet event is more likely to be in the plane defined by the emitting hard scattered parton that emitted this radiation, the second jet, and the beam rate remnant with stronger effects when the second jet is closer to the beam rapidity. And so it, I mean, it's, uh, you have, you know, gluon exchange, color exchange, with a parton involved in the heart scattering and the beam remnant, which is exactly the, the qualitatively the same setup as the PMD factorization breaking. Um, so here are just a few plots uh, and the references for CDFD0 and CMS. This is a CMS paper. This, uh, this beta variable is related to angular separation of the three jets. 
um, yeah, their titles are Evidence for Color Coherence, uh, Color Coherent Radiation and Multi-Jet Events, Probing Color Coherence Effects in PP, the CMS papers from 2014, relatively recently. Atlas has a, a measurement in a similar spirit, IET, Isolated Photon Plus Jets Production in PP. Uh, so they looked at measured, measured, they looked at isolated photons plus one, two, and three jets, and found enhancements in QCD radiation around the leading jet with respect to the photon in the directions toward the beams. So the exchanges of the room this is, this is the idea. So now, uh, motivation motivated by beyond the standard model searches, there's the Scalicchio and Schwartz paper from 2010. Their title is Seeing in Color Jet Superstructure. And this quote from the paper, the radiation on each end of a color dipole is being pulled toward the other end of the dipole. They define an observable that they call jet pull, and it's based <coughs> on these color connection ideas. And so here, uh, they have this diagram in the paper, uh, possible color connections for their sigma, which is PP goes to Higgs to BB bar. So you, you have a color neutral object produced here that then decays to a quark antiquark pair. And what's color related is the decay color quark antiquark pair. So you would expect any um, you know, additional soft radiation that is carrying the color correlation between these two in between the B and B bar decay. If it's produced by a color neutral object like the Higgs, if instead uh, one of the main backgrounds is PP to gluons to BB bar, and then if it's PP to gluons, the color connections are between um, the gluons and the remnants, or the, the gluon and the, you'd have the color connections with the remnants uh, if it went via uh, gluon rather than a color neutral object like the Higgs. And so Atlas now has a measurement from 2015 using this idea. They, their title is Measurement of Color Flow with a Jet Pull Angle in TT Bar Events. And the jet pull angle is found to correctly characterize the W boson as a color singlet. This is really a proof of principle measurement of, by Atlas, uh, demonstrating that this, they found evidence that they can make this idea work experimentally in a case where they know that they have a color, uh, you know, color neutral object. Um, so I think it'll be important to, that there's all this activity going on, I think it's going to be really important in the upcoming years to find rigorous ways to work with color dynamics in QCD. So color coherence and reconnection has already been implemented in Monte Carlo models for many years, and this has certainly been extremely useful. Right? So, uh, certainly been extremely useful, but we also need to find ways to move toward rigorous QCD calculations rather than string model type pictures. Um, you want to go, be able to go beyond that. And I'd just like to uh, call out quantum computing as one possible promising direction on EIC timescales. So unlike Lattice, you work directly in Minkowski space. Here at the University of Washington, Martin Savage's group is pioneering that. You see how they close here in the audience as a uh, QCD quantum computing pioneer. So I'm excited to see where that goes uh, over the upcoming years. So uh, most some direct relations to the EIC. So aside from obviously measuring color flow via PT odd team D function at the EIC, we're certainly going to measure the Sigurds function at the EIC. This is old news, and this is due. The fact that it's not zero is because of this gluon exchange with color flow. I think we could certainly do measurements similar to the color coherence studies done in E plus E minus PP and PP bar. Um, so you'd be looking at, say, hadrons between a produced jet and the direction of the hadronic beam remnant. Uh, maybe we could learn more through other more exclusive DIS measurements, so measure enough of the final state to be sensitive to color correlations between the current and target fragmentation regions, for example. Uh, I think exploring hadronization, uh, broadly speaking, at the EIC will also be relevant uh, if you think of it in terms of color, right? So hadronization is color neutralization, so, right? So form a hadron, a colorless hadron, from a colored parton or a colored blob, remnant, whatever, right? Even if you're not in a partonic picture, you have to have color exchange going on. Um, so being able to uh, look at, across EP, EA, PP, PA, and AA, right, where you have vacuum fragmentation pictures, recombination or coalescence pictures that have come up in the uh, high multiplicity PP, PA, and AA, uh, where you're in a more parton-rich environments, including high multiplicity of small systems, and I, I think there's definitely a lot of room for more ideas. So we're going to need to identify well-defined observables. And another comment, as often in QCD, it may be easier to isolate specific effects in simpler systems. So not only will we want to compare uh, E plus uh, e, uh, e plus P and EA to P, 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 A, and AA, but I think E plus A minus measurements with modern facilities, uh, Bell 2, 
uh, could also likely be quite useful to compare in turn to what we'll measure in EP and EA, or to use as inputs for more complex QCD systems. Um, and you could study correlations among low Z hadrons in E plus E minus. Um, maybe some of these old E plus E minus measurements are worth repeating with modern experiments. So my second to last slide here, uh, some speculation. Is, uh, well, thinking about color interactions that break factorization eventually help us develop new pictures of hadronic interactions that aren't limited to high energy approximations. So uh, degrees of freedom that aren't associated with single partons or even a partonic picture per se uh, to help us sort through particle versus field pictures of color interactions. Um, and even though we're very comfortable, we tend to be very comfortable working in this high energy regime as freedom, partonic pictures uh, where it can get relatively good intuition, and sometimes at least, but we eventually want to be able to go smoothly between these different regimes in QCD, not just work in a high energy limit or regimes, high energy density, where I can use different effective field theories. I want to be able to go smoothly across all of these things, right? Um, different pictures of hadrons, and I want to be able to do it both mathematically and conceptually. In, in the ideal world. So to summarize, the first exploratory measurements searching for team day factorization breaking and color entanglement have been performed by Phoenix. Uh, we are eagerly awaiting phenomenological calculations, assuming factorization holds, to search for deviations from our data, and we're getting started on follow-up measurements at LHCB. And there's new renewed interest uh, in uh, color interactions in QCD with motivations coming from several different communities in nuclear and HEP. So I think there's really a lot of new territory to explore as we start to think in more detail on the new waves about color uh, interactions in QCD. And the EIC will surely provide new opportunities as we develop these ideas further. Thank you. We have a bit of our time, but let's see some more questions. Yeah. Um, can you go to the slide where you had the color connection between the case of Higgs production and uh, type? Yep. Yeah. So Higgs is car stimulant, but let's say, for example, you take um, the Z boson, really young, or uh, in virtual form, really young production, and you probe the radiation close to the beam, you're going to find radiation there. The fact that you have factorization is the is that you ignore the radiation. You measure something that is not sensitive to that radiation. If I measure transverse energy of the event in a drill young process, it's going to be very sensitive to soft and collinear radiation close to the beam. And uh, it's, I don't know why will that radiation be any different from a diagent process, for example, other than additional soft radiation between power connections of the final two. So I don't think the claim is that there's zero radiation. It's somehow that there's additional radiation between the color connected, uh, color connected parts of the process. Um, I'm not sure so where to go from there. So, and again, these, things, these are qualitative pictures, right? So these, yeah, yeah. these aren't quantitative calculations of how much radiation you should have you know, and what its you know, kinematic distribution should look like. And so this is where we need to go from qualitative pictures to quantitative treatments uh, in the upcoming years. But Actually, if I may say something about this topic. Uh, so I think there is the issue of the coloring of the factorization breaking of color mm -hmm. which is supposed to be a leading twist effect. Mm -hmm. While there may be Power corrections, I, I, I appreciate. Sure, it, yeah, yeah, sure. Which sure. are maybe yeah. involved in a picture which is still factorizable, I mean, it still assumes factorization, but takes into account that it is. Yeah. And then, if maybe the source of these things can be cast in the language of IR twist, saving factorization, and maybe there is a relation with the uh, with the, the topics that Matthias was uh, was talking about, so IR twist is also related to transverse force and, and, and color pulls and, and pushes. So, if anything, I think the hope may be one can uh, assume or, or, or prove factorization or assume factorization and go to the to IR twist and see if there is a connection. Mm -hmm. You said one can prove factorization. No, I guess. Okay. one can ask. Yeah, yeah. I, nice well, I, 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 I want to go look at. I want to go find experimental evidence for novel quantum correlated QCD systems. Yeah, but it could be the same things are related to really factorization breaking effects. 
the same yeah. things are related to still, uh, to, uh, to effects that can still be cast in a factorized way. But but we uh, work uh, 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 sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, so these the searches we've been doing are like motivated by the specific context of the Rogers and Walters 2010 TMD factorization breaking pictures. So there are certainly a lot of ways one can break factorization. <laughs> qualitatively speaking, I, but this is what I, I think was nice about that prediction. One of the things that's nice about the prediction that it was coming out of not these qualitative string pictures, right? It was coming out of uh, TMD formalism, right? And so, uh, but yeah, Werner? Well, I'm still not quite, you know, a little bit unsure what, what exactly the observable would be there. Uh, right? I mean, you, yeah, yeah, I would we, imagine we, that. We need to keep yeah, I would imagine that, that looking at okay. things like um, like width or something is <coughs> not very um, promising. I mean, because you know, um, the main part of the width using pseudo double logs or something will be will not be broken no way. And so, so I wouldn't you know expect anything major, major, major to happen in that kind of thing. Rather, you know, spin physics is, is much more promising in that respect because you may have cases where you know really. Um, Naive assumption of factorization gives mm -hmm. exactly the opposite sign of the system. That kind of thing. Yeah, that is a 2013 paper. Yeah, yeah right. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the stuff I guess I would be considering, considering to be most promising. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so I, I realize that these, um, these systems are much more complex than systems, other types of quantum systems where you convince yourself that you can't get factorized factors. So, but is there hope that there can be created like a bell esque experiment here where we can actually see oh, what? Like oh, a bell esque? Oh, like, like a bell and a bell type experiment, huh. right? Where you can just take it to decide whether you have created a factor in this decision. Uh, Tim and I were talking about that a tiny bit uh, yesterday. Um, we're not there yet, but uh, I don't know. We, we need new ideas, right? We need different, you know, to think about new observables. So, uh, so I think we're at sort of the tip of the iceberg in thinking in these new ways about color interaction with PCB and novel. I mean, PCB is the only theory in the standard model that both admits bound states and it's not abelian. The weak force is not abelian if you don't get weak bound states, right? And so what can we do with it that we can't do with QED? No. So there's a lot to explore. John Wayne? Well, uh, I don't know exactly what the best way to put it, but I think uh, what in PCD, uh, color interaction is everywhere. Whatever you sure, do, yeah. Look for any observable of course. with identified high drop, there's no factorization period in all power. And maybe the leading power works, the uh, next leading power may work, and uh, you know, there's no all order factorization period. So even draw yeah. Simple step process. Everybody use factor formula. Factorization only works for the first two power, the regional power and the one of the Q power. That's it. Okay. If you go beyond that, one to the fourth correction chain, so there's no factorization. Because the color entangled, color interaction everywhere. There's the factorization factor is approximation. We right. say in certain kinematic region, then the color entanglement is suppressed because they yeah, have long correlated factor. So so I think one thing is look for the break factorization. That's one thing we have been talking about. Another thing is uh, look for the process, which is directly connected to color entanglement, but it's still measurable or factorized. Mm -hmm. uh, factorized in the sense, if one example is like single string symmetry, for example. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the, all in the collinear proton pictures, then as we say, it's really weak. Then, uh, Single space symmetry vanish and you can call formalism. Yep. In the collinear factorizing. Right. Then to to show that it's not vanish, of course there is many effects. One possible effect is because of the color force, because you can have a compartment a single, with the amplitude you have a single acting core. And mm -hmm. still half PCD vector interaction never change the break the felicity. Yep. And so then on the complex conjugate, how can you fit with the spin? So you have a core ground composite state. The core okay. stay with uh, the same polarity, but you want to just have in the opposite direction, carry the color. Mm -hmm. 
and, and also relative to the spin one. Yep. So in that case, you can flip the spin, you can generate this kind of symmetry, but this you may not be the only one, you can, you can be on that. So those type of observable, even though we find a way to factorize them, but has a lot of information on some of the kind of things that we may just appear in different ways. So that, that's why I say, I'm not sure how to put it, but you, there's a so, two channel. One is the most important thing is, you know, you see expressive breaking. Uh -huh. Another way is to really look for the observable. You might be able to uh, calculate or predict that compared with the experiment, but the observer itself, including a lot of dynamics involving color. Uh, sure, color. and I mean, the simple sign change, so I guess, would already be an example of that, right? Where you're looking at that's a part of Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so finding, finding other examples would, would be great. But if we really sit down and think about what we can, uh, what we could measure, that would be both calculable and sensitive to interesting, interesting uh, color dynamics. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have to close the discussion at this point. Let's thank Christine again. Let's go to the next talk.